The problem today is exactly the problem that we faced with Al Capone. Uh, it's the unholy alliance of politicians, hoodlums, and police. It hasn't changed. It's just gone a little deeper undercover. To a great extent in this city, at least as of today, and I think it has ever been thus, you can get an awful lot more done by going to your local hoodlums than going to your local politicians. The Chicago police on their way to a suspected murder. In the city with a worldwide reputation for gangland violence, the patrolmen are looking for two mobsters who have been missing for days. In July 1983, they turn up in the trunk of a car. Their mutilated and decomposing bodies are stinking out the neighborhood. Uh, you have to go to the truck, get there. Your jet in, uh, got got both of them, man. Both of them, These are the latest victims of Chicago's mob war. The Chicago Crime Commission has logged over 1,000 gangland killings since it started counting in 1919. For generations, mobsters have been murdering each other on the streets of Chicago most of them killed by persons unknown. And it still goes on. The criminal organization that kills in Chicago today gunned its way to power during Prohibition. In 1920, Prohibition became law, forcing legitimate brewers and distillers to shut down. The sale of alcoholic drink was now illegal, but America's thirst was as great as ever and criminals were only too ready to quench it. Bootleggers rushed to supply this new illegal market. They muscled in on a business worth $2 billion a year. Organized crime's road to riches was paved with the good intentions of the temperance movement. Among the young gangsters who cut their criminal teeth in prohibition were the men who would rule America's organized crime for the next 50 years. They filled every kind of bottle with any concoction. Home-brewed wines and rotgut spirits were passed off as French champagne, London gin, or Jamaican rum. The profits were colossal. All over America, stills bubbled away to keep the nation drinking. Some of them were raided by a new force of 2,000 prohibition agents set up to scour the country for bootleggers. The agents carried out spectacular raids, especially when the newsreel cameras were turned. They would even destroy Moonshiner's vehicles, but enforcing the despised law was beyond them. For every bootlegger whose business went up in flames, another was always ready to start brewing. Most city bootleggers came from countries where drinking was a virtue, not a vice. Prohibition won no support in America's little Italy's. You know, there were bootleggers uh, on almost every block, it seemed, uh, whiskey. And it was a common sight for everybody, you know. And as a youngster, you would see these things. You would see the operation uh, on a regular basis. And occasionally, there would be a police raid where they would uh, go into these barns and throw the cans of uh, moonshine out into the alley and break them open and let it spill on the ground. Everybody would come running around with cups. Some of the greatest careers were made at sea by the rum runners. 
Americans soon shunned home-brewed beer and rotgut spirits and demanded the real thing from across the Atlantic. American brandy never tasted like French cognac. Gangsters landed their contraband spirits from offshore islands just outside American waters. Soon, almost as much liquor was being smuggled into America as had been imported legally before Prohibition. Rum running became the major business of Caribbean ports as gangsters financed the bootleg armada. The US Coast Guard's reply was a fleet of gunships. Smugglers and Coast Guards were often killed in battles at sea, but a few gunships could not stop the rum runners beating Prohibition. There was an even bigger smuggling problem on America's border with Canada. Now that the ice has disappeared, the US Customs Patrol fleet starts its annual game of hide and seek with rum, dope, alien, or what have you smugglers along the Detroit River and the Great Lakes. There are 30 of the fast little fellows all ready to chase any long, low, rakish craft as pirates are always supposed to have, and they can smell hooch a mile away. They make a pretty sight in formation like a bunch of runabouts on review, but to Mr. Rum Runner, they look like a lot of hornets. And can they sting? Despite the Coast Guard, the Rum Runners flooded America's cities with Canadian beer and whiskey. In Chicago, prohibition made organized crime richer and more powerful than ever. The city's prosperous gambling bosses and brothel keepers were now making so much money from bootlegging they could corrupt any policeman. Few policemen believed prohibition was a law worth enforcing. Abner Bender joined Chicago's police in 1922. On his first patrol in the Italian quarter, he found himself unwittingly on the take. I was going up and down the street. I was signed to that street. And it was nothing but moonshine. It was, if you had a kind of a humid day or evening or a foggy day, you had no problem. You'd just drive up and down the alleys and sniff around. <laughs> you could smell the stills cooking. Uh, as, a, as a matter of fact, I was in on several raids where we made arrests and went to court and got convictions and so forth, where I tried to do my job, the whole thing. Payoffs to street cops were only the lowest level of corruption. Cartoonists saw bribes to politicians as Chicago's worst problem. Gangsters controlled the city's politics as if it were just another racket, and they carried on killing. No one who hoped to become a political big shot in Chicago could ignore the mob or its money. In Chicago politics, unfortunately, you had to have links with less respectable people. The, the downtown area uh, always was ruled by politicians who had close ties with the mob, sometimes relatives of leaders in the mob. And uh, uh, if you wanted to be mayor, you simply directly or through subordinates would deal with them. Otherwise, you'd just as uh, likely lose all of those things. The so-called river wards, Republican and Democratic, both uh, were in people, if not in the underworld, were in the periphery of the underworld. And the respectables had to deal with them. Big Jim Colosimo was the first Italian mob boss of Chicago. He bribed politicians to make sure his whorehouses weren't raided. In return, Big Jim made sure those politicians won the Italian vote. The gangsters of the Prohibition era started out, in many of them, as bullies for politicians on election day, uh, stealing votes and frightening off uh, voters favoring the opposition. But they got such, made such tremendous sums of money that they become far, far richer than the politicians, so they became the bosses of the men that they once served as, uh, as footpads. John Torrio, an immigrant from Naples, Italy, was a footpad turned mob millionaire. When Colosimo was murdered in 1920, Torrio took over his vice empire. 
he soon became Chicago's biggest bootlegger, aided by another Neapolitan, a violent young criminal wanted for murder in New York, Alphonse Capone, alias Al Capone, Al Brown, Scarface. His famous scar came not from gangland vengeance, but a barroom brawl. Capone took over Torrio's gang in 1925, when Torrio fled from Chicago and its mounting violence. Capone would bring that violence to a peak. He built up a huge bootlegging empire. He expanded Torrio's gambling rackets, and he had the city's top politicians in his pocket. Capone became a celebrity in Chicago and across America. He was a degenerate gambler and admitted losing more than $7 million on the horses. But whether at the races or at a baseball game, as Chicago's mob boss, he was fated wherever he went. Among his friends was Roland Libanati, a young lawyer who was already a state congressman. Libanati went on to serve as a congressman in Washington. He still works as a lawyer in Chicago today. In the 1920s, he saw how Capone eliminated his rivals. Mr. Capone sent for them. And he uh, laid down the law that they were all through, that they would have to go to work. One person defied him and said to him, you have your racket, I have mine. Capone said, that the way you feel about it? He said, yes. Nobody knows what happened to this fellow. Take some claim he went to, to Utica, New York. Some claim he left for Italy. Nobody knows. But everybody knows that Capone's statements were always dealt with great respect. obviously had a reputation for he, murdering. Well, murder, people. murder of, of who? Murder of those that transgressed in this so-called policy of you take this area, I take this area. You come over here and try to take my area, then I have to prevent you from doing it. All of those murders were competitive murders between themselves, not respectability. Hey? Not persons who, who were actually uh, involved in, in uh, legal pursuits. Hey? Their competitive business arrangements were the ones caused the murders. By New Year 1929, Al Capone had gunned down almost all his underworld rivals. From his old strongholds in South Chicago and the southwest suburbs, Capone had expanded his empire east and north. The only remaining resistance came from the north side. In February 1929, Capone moved against George Bugs Moran, the only gang boss still daring to oppose him. On St. Valentine's Day, Moran was expecting a delivery of bootleg liquor. That morning, a young newspaper photographer got an urgent call from his news editor. Then about 10 o'clock that morning, he called me and told me to go to 2122 North Clark Street that there was a shooting there. As, as I entered, entered this building, there was, a, there was a hallway to the back of, of the garage, and, uh, and I happened to see all these bodies there. So I jumped on top of a truck and uh, made this photograph. In Moran's warehouse, six men had been machine gunned to death. A seventh survived long enough to be taken to hospital, but he died still refusing to name his killers. The dead were Moran's top gunmen, his business managers, a safe cracker, and an unfortunate doctor who just liked to hang around wise guys. The only witness was a dog, terrified by 90 machine gun blasts. The killers had dressed up as policemen and their uniforms had fooled Moran's men into lining up for their own execution. The real cops arrived soon after. 
In a room across the street, two lookout men had watched Moran's men arrive. They made one mistake. Moran was not there. But his gang had been destroyed forever. No one was ever charged with the most notorious slaughter in gangland history. Al Capone had the perfect alibi. He was 1,400 miles away, enjoying the sunshine at his villa in Florida. Did you ever guess or work out who must have ordered the killing? Oh, well, I would guess that Al Capone ordered it. And I, 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 would, I would say I'm sure that he did. I'm not, without, anybody's, uh, without anybody ever telling me, I know that he did. Or that it wouldn't have happened. Back in town, Al was the good guy paying $10 for one apple to help out a war veteran. The Depression gave him the chance to act like Robin Hood. Chicago's most notorious citizen, Al Capone, king of the gangsters, appears in a new role, that of public benefactor, when he sets up soup kitchens to feed unemployed. It costs Al $2,500 per week to feed these men. First real meal in days, thanks to Mr. Capone's hospitality. I wasn't for our friend Al Capone, old roping up in this here White House on 935 South State Street. We wouldn't eat. I appreciate the soup. On a Sunday in a cold day, soup is very hot. When these poor men here, I enjoyed myself. I sure. All these poor guys here are just naturally hungry and starving now. Look, look what Capone's doing for these poor guys. He's doing all this himself. He never robbed nobody on the streets. He never took advantage of anybody by selling them liquor that wasn't the real the McCoy, you know. He handled the best. Somebody spilled the beans, and now prohibition agents are spilling the beer. Thousands of gallons with plenty of kick. There's no doubt about it, the raid is a smashing success. Talk about showers, how'd you like to stand under this one? Before the raiders burst the doors and kegs, the brewery was turning out $5,000 worth of beer a day. At 25 cents a glass, this was 20,000 glasses per day. But now that day's gone forever. The foaming torrent is headed for the Chicago River, where the fish will inhale it free of charge. They say this kind of work makes even the agents thirsty. So sometimes they take time out to have a glass of uh, water. But they manage to grin and bear it. Capone wasn't threatened only by prohibition agents. His biggest enemies were inside his own crime army. This is a photograph of uh, Anselmi and uh, Scalise. I would say they, they were his two best enforcers. They scared the hell out of, of any tavern owner that didn't buy booze from, from, from Al's place, from Al's brewery. They were so tough that uh, they decided that, uh, that Al Capone shouldn't be the boss, that they should be. And Al Capone found out about this, and he gave them a nice banquet at a, at a restaurant and uh, made a nice little speech. And after he got through making his little talk, he picked up a baseball bat and and, and killed both of them with a baseball bat. But Al's murderous reign as king of Chicago's rackets was about to end. Despite bootleg profits of $100 million a year, he had got away with paying almost no taxes. The revenue men proved from his luxurious lifestyle he should have paid a fortune. In 1931, Capone went on trial for tax evasion. He told reporters he was being martyred for giving the people what they wanted, good liquor. Capone tried to fix the jury, but he was convicted and sentenced to 11 years in jail. He could not believe it. Chicago could not believe it either. Capone's reign as the most powerful man in the city was over. He was only 32 years old. Talk about excitement at the county jail. It's finally come to pass, and here's the proof. Mr. Alphonse Capone, alias Mr. Al Brown, alias the Big Shot, has met the enemy and he is there, on his way to the Dearborn Street Station with an escort that'll do credit to a sultan. It won't be long now before the world's most notorious gangster will be only an offensive memory. And if he behaves himself while he's the guest of Uncle Sam in Atlanta, 
he'll be out again in only seven and a half years. And so, up until 1940, Mr. Capone will be Mr. 40,886. Now for a change, they're taking him for a ride. Let that be a good lesson to you. Always be sure and pay your income tax. Capone was soon moved to America's most secure jail, Alcatraz. Now no bribes or payoffs could set him free. To most Americans, Capone was the archetypal gangster and the archetypal Italian. They thought we were all a bunch of gangsters. If you went around, if you went somewhere and you said, uh, my name is Tony Berardi, immediately they thought I was a member of the Capone mob. And if anybody, and anybody, and I've had a few people that idolized the bum. And I used to get so mad, and I'd say, how could you idolize a bum like that? He hurt his father, he hurt you, he hurt your mother, he hurt, he hurt every Italian that lived in that area. Because he was national. He was not just a Chicago uh, mobster. Hell, he corrupted uh, congressmen. He, he corrupted uh, every politician that he could possibly corrupt throughout the country. Here in New York, the word is flashed. The whole nation, even the world, watches America enter a new era. Rush the legal drinks to the 18 states where sale immediately starts. On Broadway, under police escort against hijackers, the liquor rolls to hotels and restaurants that have waited 13 years and 10 months for the right to sell the real thing. And how the crowd is greeting it. Take it, Mr. and Mrs. America. Here it is. Prohibition came to an end in 1933. It had been a disaster for America, but the making of the mob. Al Capone was released from jail in 1939, suffering from advanced syphilis. Seriously ill in mind and body, he was taken by his family to his island home in Miami. There he lingered for seven years until he died in 1947. Only now did Al Capone return to Chicago. His body was driven to Mount Carmel Cemetery, where most of the mourners were pressmen. It was a modest send-off for the most notorious gangster of all time. After Capone had been thrown out of Chicago, his crime syndicate continued to flourish. The Chicago Outfit, as it calls itself, invested its bootleg millions in both criminal and legitimate business. It was now one of the richest corporations in America. Al Capone was succeeded as boss of the outfit by his longtime bodyguard and gunman, Frank Nitti. Nitti committed suicide rather than go to jail. He was succeeded by Paul Rica, another Capone killer. He did go to jail, and by the mid-1940s, Anthony Accardo was running the Chicago mob. In 1958, Accardo, another Capone hitman, faced persistent questioning about his past from Robert Kennedy. Now, uh, Mr. Accardo, in 1931, uh, you and four other of the Capone uh, syndicates, including Paul Labriola's stepfather, were seized in raids uh, following the uh, torch slaying of Mike Heitler. Is that correct? H-E-I-T-L-E-R. I declined to answer. Uh, Mr. Heitler uh, was burned to death, was he? I declined to answer. Can you, uh, what grounds? On the grounds that it may tend to incriminate or lead me into something. Yeah, wh why was it selected to burn, uh, that he should be burned to death? I declined to answer. Accardo took the Fifth Amendment to fend off claims from Kennedy that he had been a killer for Capone and was now Chicago's most powerful gangster. Did you have all the leading gangsters in the United States the 4th of July party? Declined to answer. Here's a man who's been a force in organized crime for parts of seven decades, if you can believe that. He was a bodyguard, a hitman, a killer for Al Capone in the 1920s. Under Nitty, he was a strong, strong-arm guy, and he, be, and he started to rise to power. And in, in 1940s, actually, he ascended to the throne. He was the number one guy. In 1957, Accardo handed over the job of Chicago's crime boss to Sam Giancana. He was yet another Prohibition gunman who had worked with Accardo for years. Giancana became boss at just the wrong time. 
For years, the Chicago outfit had been protected by local police and politicians. But now the FBI began to investigate the city's top hoodlums. FBI agents put Giancana under the closest surveillance. Bill Romer followed him everywhere. No matter where he went, we were going to stay with him right by his side. If he went to the, to the toilet uh, in a restaurant, we would go right with him and stand by him uh, while he tended to himself. Uh, no matter what he did, if he was eating, whether he was uh, golfing, whatever it was that, uh, that he did. I knew from the extensive background investigation that I had conducted on Giancana that he was an animal. Uh, the guy was a beast, really. And he'd raped and killed and murdered and tortured. And uh, he, that was the way he ascended to power, to become the number one guy. He had to do what they called make his bones. Uh, in order to make your bones, you have to, to, to get involved in what they call the heavy work. And he was a master at the heavy work. And I, realizing that, uh, I felt no, no problems whatsoever in, uh, in conducting a, a hard surveillance of Giancana. The FBI followed not only Giancana, but also his beautiful mistresses. Phyllis McGuire, the popular singer, was with him when he flew into Chicago in 1961. FBI men were at the airport to serve her with an order to testify about her mafia boyfriend. To Giancana's fury, they took Phyllis away. Has this hurt your career? Uh, I hope not. I hope it hasn't. Has, has your association with uh, Giancana in the past hurt your career, do you think? Uh, I'm very warm. Giancana was just livid. He, was, he became the animal that he really is, really was at that time, and he tore into me in public. We were in the public waiting room of the terminal there at the airport at O'Hare with a hundred, perhaps, people around, and he called me every name that you can think of, every obscene name that you can think of. I called everybody else around, and I said, you people are just passing through Chicago. You don't have to live with this scum, this slime right here, and I pointed to Giancana. He just became hysterical, and he told me, he said, Romer, you lit a fire tonight that'll never go out. He said, Romer, this we will, you will never forget. You will rue the day that you ever did this tonight. Another of Giancana's lovers was Judith Exner, an artist from Hollywood. She was introduced to Sam by the singer Frank Sinatra. She heard all about Giancana's encounters with Roma and his colleagues. Giancana uh, had a long war with the FBI. What did he tell you about uh, his his attitude towards the FBI? Oh, he was very bitter, and of course he had a very sometimes cavalier attitude about it. He, he, and he would make jokes about having outwitted them. I think at one time he, he won a harassment suit in, in the courts in Chicago against them, but uh, he naturally was very bitter about their constant surveillance. One place the FBI kept under surveillance was the Armory Lounge on Chicago's west side. This was Giancana's headquarters. The FBI bugged the table where he met his mafia lieutenants and talked business. The Armory was, it seemed to be Sam's headquarters in a sense because the, a great many people used to come and and see him. We would go, I would arrive in Chicago and, and check into my hotel. I used to stay at the Ambassador East and he would come to pick me up and we'd go straight to the armory and spend hours on end when it, when it wasn't open and there were always people coming in to see him and he used to kid because they would, they would, they wouldn't speak English. It was always Sicilian and I would tease him about it and Several times he would say, you don't want to know what we're talking about. Judith Exner was also the lover of John F. Kennedy. Their affair began while Kennedy was campaigning to become president of the United States. After Kennedy had won the election, their love affair continued in the White House. Throughout this time, Kennedy knew that Judith was also seeing the mafia boss of Chicago. He knew of Sam. He used to ask me, did I talk to Sam? He knew any time I was in Chicago, uh, I would leave Washington and very often stop and sometimes just have dinner with, with Sam. Uh, 
he knew he would ask me, are you stopping in Chicago? Uh, a couple of times he got upset. He said, you're seeing too much of Sam. Sam, on the other hand, wanted me to stop seeing Jack. Uh, he wanted a relationship. He didn't force it, but he wanted a relationship. He didn't like Jack. Uh, at least that's what he said to me. He, at one point in our relationship, in our friendship, he said, your boyfriend wouldn't even be president if it wasn't for me. That's, the, that's a very interesting point. Now, what did he explain to you? He didn't explain anything. Um, the only thing that lay in later years that it meant to me was the report that a great many votes had been stolen uh, and a great many votes that there had been some illegal activity as far as the voting in Chicago and Cook County. And Sam claimed responsibility for it. In January 1961, John F. Kennedy became America's 35th president. He had been elected in the closest race this century. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States. And will... If Kennedy had lost Chicago and the state of Illinois, he could have lost the presidency. Kennedy might never have taken the oath, but for the efforts of Sam Giancana, the mafia boss of Chicago. Of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Giancana assisted the uh, election of Kennedy. If Kennedy hadn't won Illinois, he would have been very, very hard pressed to win the election. It was that tight. And Mayor Daley, of course, helped considerably. But Giancana, with his control of the West Side Bloc and the, and the politicians that were under his influence and control in Chicago, materially assisted in the election of John Kennedy. Having helped Kennedy, Giancana believed the president would get the FBI off his back. Instead, he made his brother attorney general to lead a new fight against the mob. In every assignment he has undertaken, I believe that he has distinguished himself. His work with the Rackets Committee on which I served showed his intellectual energy, his courage, his integrity, and his organizing ability. I am uh, pleased to accept the position of the Attorney Generalship uh, of the United States. Robert Kennedy was a very, very dedicated and capable crime fighter. And he recognized that in Chicago, uh, organized crime was, uh, was at the height of its power and, and more dangerous perhaps than any place else, and that the leader, Sam Giancana, was a very, very capable, a very, very aggressive guy, and that he should be the number one target of organized crime investigations in the United States. What uh, guidance did uh, Kennedy give you? Probably for the first time in the history of massive law enforcement, in national law enforcement in the city of Chicago, we had absolute 100% backing. Whatever was needed within the realm of, of uh, legality was always available at a moment's notice. But the CIA, America's Central Intelligence Agency, was employing the Chicago mob at the same time as the Kennedys were fighting them. A few months before the presidential election, the CIA approached Sam Giancana through his lieutenant, Johnny Roselli. Roselli and Giancana were contracted by the CIA to murder Fidel Castro. The agency wanted Cuba's new revolutionary leader dead because he was anti-American and a communist. The mafia wanted Castro dead for another reason. Since the 1930s, American mobsters had run casinos on Cuba. Heavy gamblers were flown into Havana and fleeced of their fortunes. Most of America's crime families had a piece of the action. In 1960, Havana's casinos were still in business, but Castro was about to shut them down and destroy one of the mob's richest rackets. Santo Traficante was the man Giancana and Roselli thought best place to kill Castro. The mafia boss of Tampa, Florida, Traficanti owned casinos in Cuba and still had many friends on the island. So they says Santa would be the logical guy to have it done because he had 
he was in Cuba all the time. So they went to talk to uh, Sando, and uh, they told Sando, you know, kill him some way. And if you do, we get all, all the favors we want from the government. So he says he would do it. Castro was now the target of an alliance between America's government and some of its worst criminals. But Trafficanti did not share the enthusiasm of Roselli and Giancana. The plot to kill Castro withered away. Sano had, could have killed him in a minute. You know, I know that uh, Castro was running around there loose as a goose when he first took over there, you know. And there would have been no problem. But Sano just didn't want to do it. He didn't do it. When I had my confrontation with Giancana at O'Hare Airport, he said to me, hey, we're supposed to be on the same side, aren't we? And I really didn't know what he was talking about at that time. That went over my head, and I had no idea of what uh, the meaning of it was. But apparently what he was trying to tell me was that uh, he was working for the United States government also. Uh, we later found out that uh, uh, there was some indication that he was uh, attempting with Johnny Roselli, who was a henchman of his, to uh, poison Castro. When the Castro plot was revealed 14 years later, most Americans were shocked. Could the state really have hired gangsters to kill the head of another state? The woman who loved both the mafia boss and the president was not so surprised. The one thing I recognized was there are no black hats and there are no white hats. They all conduct themselves the exact same. And very good evidence of that is that the CIA would hire two so-called mafia men, Sam Giancana and John Roselli, to assassinate Fidel Castro. Um, if there's such a difference, you're not supposed to have anything to do with each other. But in, in essence, the remark is really they're all in bed together. They all do business together in the same way. Giancana's work for the government earned him no favors from the FBI who put him in jail in 1965. When he came out, he fled to Mexico. Eight years later, he came back, but his days as Chicago's crime boss were over. He's got in trouble. You know, they start going after him, the government start going after him. So he just took off, left the country. He, Johnny told me he had a lot of money when he left, a few million dollars, two or three million. I understand that Mexico just ripped him off. And when he come back, he was broke. And he tried to take over where he left off, and next thing I know, he's dead. At his suburban Chicago home in June 1975, Sam Giancana was shot dead. It was a classic gangland hit. He must have known and trusted his killer, for he died without a struggle. Uh, he had $1,400 on his person when they uh, checked the body, and uh, his wallet was lying next to his head uh, on the left side. Any forcible entry to the basement? There's no forcible entry that we could find. Any other people in the house at the time? The caretaker and his wife. They were, in, they were upstairs in the back room watching TV, and they said they had an air conditioner on, and they did not hear any shots. Professional job? Looks like it. For the Chicago Mafia, this was business as usual. Giancana was around the thousandth mob murder in the city since 1919. He may have been killed because he was trying to regain his leadership of the Chicago mob. But he could also have been murdered because he was going to expose the Mafia's plot to kill Castro before a Senate committee in Washington. One man who did testify in Washington was Johnny Roselli. He revealed he had been recruited by the CIA, along with Giancana. He thus broke the Mafia code of omerta, silence. He had signed his own death warrant. Johnny Roselli went missing one year after Giancana was murdered. Then an oil drum was found in the sea containing Roselli's body, weighed down with chains. The barrel finally surfaced in a Florida creek. No one doubted that the men who killed Giancana had also killed Roselli. The man now running the Chicago family was once again Tony Accardo, 
who had led the outfit before in the 1940s and 50s. Accardo wanted to quit, but the family needed him to repair the damage inflicted by the FBI during the Giancana years. Accardo shared the job with Joey Ayupa. As Chicago's joint boss, Ayupa was determined to wipe out anyone loyal to Giancana and Roselli. Ayupa knew that Roselli had worked closely with the Los Angeles Mafia boss, Jimmy Fratiano. Ayupa tested you, didn't he? He gave you a description. Yeah, he kind of gave me a test, yeah. Tell us about To see what I, uh, how I felt, you know, about the killing of Roselli. He start, uh, he said, Jimmy said, uh, remember that guy, he says he was going like this with his finger, right? The guy they found with a, in a barrel. He said, well, what's his name? He's looking at me in the eye, you know, I'm looking at him, right? Uh, who are you talking about? Roselli? Oh, yeah, Johnny, what do you think of that? And he's still looking at me, right? It's one of them things, yeah. What are you going to do? You know, he was waiting what, what I, my reaction would be, you know. So if I would have said something like, hey, I'd like to find out who, you know, I'd have never left that room alive. These are the mob bosses of Chicago today in a picture taken by one of their own crime family. The party celebrating at the Sicilian Manor restaurant includes Accardo, Ayupa, and their top lieutenants. That picture is so significant because it's the only time in the history I know of any mob where they all sat down to be counted and had their color photograph taken of each other. These men have America's second city by the throat. They not only control its rackets, they own policemen, politicians, labor unions, and hundreds of legitimate businesses. It's no different than American corporations like General Motors or any big company uh, uh, running a business, legitimate business. But the only thing is General Motors uh, is not taking illegal money to build a car. But these, the, the uh, Italian mafia there in Chicago would be then taking illegal heroin drug money and building a nice restaurant or building a glass factory, or building uh, a ballpark, or whatever, or buying into a ballpark, or buying a piece of this. All legitimate. That's the problem the government's having right now, and the FBI really does have a problem, because it's, you have to catch them before they put the money into legitimate business. How are you going to do it? And that's the problem. At a service station in Chicago, members of this criminal corporation gather to talk business. The boys have come a long way from bootleg booze. They still run the old rackets like gambling and money lending, but now they own restaurants, retail stores, laundries, vending machine businesses, and factories. Everything the public wants to buy, they sell. They look harmless enough, even respectable, like any other group of middle-aged businessmen. But with this difference, they work for a corporation which kills the most violent mob in America. In 1983, Ken Ito, a Japanese gambling boss working under the mafia, faced a long prison sentence. Chicago's crime bosses feared he would inform on them, so they ordered his murder. Ito was shot five times and left for dead. But he survived and told police all he knew about the outfit. Ito also named the men who had tried to kill him. One was Jasper Campisi, an old mafia soldier who had long run gambling and loan sharking for the Chicago family. The other was a policeman, John Gattuso, a deputy sheriff of Cook County. As a result of Ito's evidence, Gattuso and Campisi were charged with attempted murder out on bail, they disappeared in July 1983. They were missing for two days. Then one evening, Campisi's car was found 30 miles away from Chicago. Cameras were kept back as police prized open the boot. What? There they go. Here they go. Here they go. We got the line set up down here. You have to go to the truck, get there. Got both in there, man. 
Both Campisi the mobster and Gattuso the deputy sheriff had been repeatedly stabbed. Gattuso had been strangled. They suffered agonizing deaths, far from the clean executions of mafia movies. They were killed because they had failed to kill the informer Ito. Campisi the mafia soldier and Gattuso the corrupt cop were now united in death as they had been in life, part of that unholy alliance of mobsters, police and politicians that has exploited Chicago since the days of Al Capone. Has anything got better in the last 50 years in this city? Oh yes, if uh, the one thing that's gotten better is that there's a little more public awareness of the fact that there is this all pervading uh, influence. I can recall when we began, I had people come up to me saying, why do you bother with this? Why are you going out after these hoodlums? We have things nice the way they are. Why do you want to change them? However, if, you want to, if you're saying, is the hoodlum influence any less today than it was 50 years ago? It's more. It's just a little better hidden. You don't have an Al Capone out at the ballpark uh, eating hot dogs with the mayor. It's all going on in back rooms, but it's there. It's there as it has never been there. And one wonders if it will ever change. Oh, God, I can smell it. I can smell it. Incredible. 